My name is Byron Johnson. I'm from Baylor University, and I'm also from Pepperdine University. It's, it's a new arrangement and sounded odd to say, but very proud of that. Um, welcome to the panel on social science and public morality. You're in for a treat. Uh, it's going to be a little bit different than the last panel, uh, as enjoyable as that was. Um, so you're going to he hear some number of crunching social scientists um, sharing data um, about what we know related to this topic. And then we're also going to hear from uh, a social entrepreneur, a problem solver. Um, so let me do, do some introductions, and then I'll have a seat, and the rest of the, the panel will, will all be seated as, as we move forward. So I'm going to introduce them. Uh, next to me is Mark Regneris. I've had the privilege of knowing Mark for a couple of decades. Um, he is a professor of sociology at the University of Texas. He's also president of the Austin Institute in um, Austin, Texas, which also has ties to Robbie, as most of us do in this room. I was thinking, Robbie, where are you? I saw him a second ago. You know, you kind of remind me of Nick Saban if you follow <laughs> college football. <laughs> Because you have all these coaches around the country that they're all attached to the Nick Saban tree. And I feel like most of us are attached to the Robbie George tree um, that are here. Except we're not trying to kill you on the weekends, you know. <laughs> we adore you. Um, but Mark has written many papers and books that are directly relevant to the, the subject that we're about to hear about today. And he has written four books by Oxford Press, each related to our topic, the most two recent really are spot on the future of Christian marriage by Oxford Press, and then cheap sex and the transformation of men and marriage and monogamy. Um, so uh, you'll look forward to hearing from him in just a moment. Uh, Brad Wilcox, who I've also known for a long, long time, um, I, he is at the University of Virginia. He's also a sociologist, but he also, like Mark, wears several hats. He directs the National Marriage Project. He's a senior fellow um, at the Institute for Family Studies. He's also a non-resident fellow here at AEI, um, as well as at Baylor. Um, he was a fellow at Yale when we first met. And in fact, these two guys, John DiIulio and I, back in the day, I think in 2000, we both heard about Mark and Brad, and we said we got to get them to Penn, where we were both uh, running a center there uh, for the study of religion and urban civil society. And so we brought them to town and commissioned them to do some of the projects that they, they have continued to do over the last couple of decades. And so uh, Brad's written a number of important books, um, When Marriage Disappears, The Retreat from Marriage in Middle America, and Gender and Parenthood, Biological and Sociological uh, perspectives. So two top sociologists. I'm so glad that they could be here. And then last is someone that I've only known shortly, and I hate that because <laughs> Ian Rowe is an amazing, amazing person. And, you know, I asked him earlier, these things that I'm reading in your bio, do they happen at different times in your life or all at the same time? <laughs> because he has founded a number of different organizations He's the CEO of a number of different organizations dealing with character-based education, uh, charter schools in, in, in Bronx, uh, New York, um, and he, he's affiliated with the Woodson Center, our dear friend Bob Woodson, and he writes for the 1776 Unites campaign. He is truly an entrepreneur and uh, worked, I mean, you've worked for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, too, and MTV. So I don't know how all this comes together, uh, Ian, but I'm excited to hear about that. But we're going to be kicked off, uh, kicked off by Mark Regneris um, from uh, Austin, Texas. Mark, you want to get us going? Thanks, Byron. Uh, I'm going to tweak Robbie's book title just a little bit and talk about making men immoral. Uh, and then we can work backwards from there to, towards the, the, the goal. Uh, one of the perplexing factors in the efforts to make men, in particular men, moral, is their own achievements in the mating market, where men have obvious increased power today, precisely because they are more apt to be floundering in life. 
Now, how does this work? Well, not all of them have power in the mating market, and that is the key. The sexual technologies I wrote about back in Cheap Sex, the wide uptake of artificial contraception, streaming pornography, and the depersonalizing nature of online dating all make it much more possible for some men to have easier and wider and quicker access to more sexual relationships with women and for all men to have easy and quick access to mimicking real sex online. All this attracts the average man. This is particularly pronounced problem in particular places, especially Washington, D.C., a city in which I have never heard a woman say it was easy to find a good husband. In no small part, because they notably outnumber men, leaving the men even more power to be selective, picky, and slow. I dare say the share of women in D.C. who are marriage-minded notably outnumber the share of men who want to marry, at least relatively soon, which creates a situation in which power over the decision to marry flows towards men. I could say this demographic quirk about D.C. has nothing to do with sexual technology, but that just cannot be true. The only way you have scores of young women working in the district is because of the wide uptake of contraception. It doesn't matter that, say, 10% of them or 40% of them refuse to participate in that regime. They're still dramatically outnumbered by their peers who do. Success stories here, nice young woman meets and marries nice young man, are noticeable because they're more difficult to accomplish than before. It's just the way it is. Critics of mine have recently taken to claiming that sex must have gotten more expensive lately, not cheap, more expensive lately, since the data now points to men and women married and cohabiting having less less sex in general rising age at first sex, and fewer teen pregnancies. Okay, those things are happening. But I don't buy the argument that somehow sex has gotten more expensive. Sex may be getting rarer, but it hasn't gotten cheaper. It's gotten weirder. We're lonelier. Men and women are masturbating a good deal more than they used to. I mapped this statistically. Statistically significant change over five years between 2013 and 2018 on that count, both men and women. So there, you can't legislate that. I agree. But the kinds of patterns that have brought us to this place can change. We've seen them change in one direction. But that's not the only direction they can turn in. The marriage market hinges on sexual technologies. If that market, marriage market, was healthier, it would benefit more adults and the children born to them. But until we witness a downturn in the use of contraception of any sort, we're unlikely to see the marriage market rise. Until we see the marriage market, marriage rate increase, since it is a measure, among other things, of the cost of stable access to sex, until we see that marriage rate increase, it's hard to discern how men as a class will drift toward moral sexual relationships rather than away from them. Until we witness basic elevated standards in what Instagram and other online media companies show, it's hard to imagine we could create legal criteria around pornography. But until we witness successful efforts 
to limit pornography, it's hard to fathom how young men could angle towards marriage and how young women could find themselves in legitimately unpornified relationships. For sure, they could search efficiently and quickly online today for just the right qualities in a spouse. But the sheer number of possibilities along the way have a way of making everyone pickier, to see things that aren't really there, and ironically, slow the whole process down by the one thing Americans cannot resist, having more choices. So I think I'm with Robbie on one of the principles outlined in Making Men Moral, that is, the impossibility of moral neutrality in politics, particularly evident in our sexual politics. Neutrality doesn't seem to me like a standard. It's largely the absence of a standard. Of course, there are still standards, but moral neutrality breeds such modest standards that we're witnessing a race to the bottom. It makes one wonder about the realm of lawmaking or even strong norm-making in this domain today. It's near impossible to imagine that our sexual technologies could or ever will be rolled back. I can't picture it happening democratically. Basically, the terrain of what is possible here, what can foster moral men, is quite different than before the democratization of cheap sex. There are groups doing good work reducing trafficking, as well as making headway on the most egregious organizations in the realm of online pornography. But it's frustrating to win one fight and then realize that YouTube and Facebook Reels are now operating in near-pornographic territory. That that wasn't true, I'd say, two years ago. But when ad dollars sit behind clicks on suggestive content, it feels like we're playing a game of whack-a-mole. You can tell them you don't want to see it, but they're slow to accommodate your wishes. Meanwhile, organizations continue to woo people with some what seem to be to be monstrous miscalculations about where we're actually headed. I presume it's on purpose, but I don't know. For example, Bumble, the online matching app, very popular, that gives women an advantage by letting them make the first move. As far as I know, that's the only thing that's different about it from Tinder. Bumble has just released its own data-based predictions of our near future, offered by a sociologist among them. The one that particularly caught my eye, this is made for as recent or as soon as 2024. The hookup will die, they say. A desire, a growing desire for truthfulness and authenticity in dating, plus steadily increasing STD rates, according to the CDC, will result in couples taking it slower when they first meet. This is Bumble's prediction. It's ironic that an online dating app is talking about truthfulness. When the paradigm itself thrives on deception from start to finish, from the cultivation of an ideal profile to ghosting people, and we go along. But I cannot fathom how the hookup could die, certainly a quick death, given current market realities. I think what they actually mean to say is that regardless of data, Women, who in theory control Bumble, want the hookup to die. They want authenticity in dating. And they want to take it slow when they first meet. But it doesn't mean they're going to get it. The market conditions don't favor it still. Get rid of all the immoral men, or the demonstrably immoral men, 
in the mating market, and what will you have? You'll have a sex ratio so lopsided that the competition for the moral men will encourage their immorality. That's what happens when women compete for men. The model of marriage that will not go away is one that Robbie, Sharif, and Ryan have talked about, the one in which men and women provide for each other what they cannot or prefer not to provide for themselves. But the struggle for equality between the sexes seems largely about the workplace and wages, historic territory of the provision of men. Women don't need their provisions so much anymore. Fine. But we can't be surprised that some unanticipated and unpleasant consequences result. Marriage as an institution suffers, and I can't see a way that we foster a wide culture of moral men and women without a thriving institution of marriage. Don't complain to me about bad examples of marriage, because this is a social problem, and social problems are just not simply the sum total of individual experiences. They just don't work like that. So that's my opening 12 minutes or so, and uh, we'll take questions after this. Thank you, I think, Mark. (laughs) Brad, opening remarks. It's a pretty sobering start there, Mark, for us to (laughs) begin on here. My my kind of commentary is sobering as well, but not quite as sobering as Mark's. Um, So in in this book that we're talking about uh, both today and tomorrow, Robbie um, wrote that societies have reason to care about what might be called their moral ecology. And clearly, Robbie understands that there are probably no institutions that are more important to that ecology um, than the institutions of marriage and the family. But both of those have been clearly weakened in cultures, as he notes in his book, um, in which large numbers of people have come to understand themselves as satisfaction seekers. That's that's his term. Um, Dovetails with some of the points that Mark just made. And I think we kind of could talk about this in terms of like the current hunt for the latest dopamine uh, fix. He also touches on the way in which, though, it's not just sort of this uh, cultural dynamic playing out, you know, that we have, I think we're all acquainted with, but also the way in which there are changes in laws and public policies in the last half century that have combined to weaken these two core institutions. We can think about the way in which no-fault divorce has reduced confidence um, in marriage. There's new research, for instance, from, from Penn, actually, um, on the way in which no-fault divorce has helped to fuel um, inequality when it comes to marriage. Just the way it's sort of played out, it's had a more deleterious effect on working class and poor couples' confidence in marriage. That is no-fault divorce. So that's one example of kind of shifts in law have undercut the institution of marriage. And we're also, I think, aware of the way in which um, changes in welfare policies have unintentionally ended up penalizing marriage. Um, Changes, for instance, in Medicaid um, and and direct cash welfare over the last couple of decades have combined, in many cases, to make it more financially feasible to cohabit or have kids on your own rather than um, to marry. So these are ways in which changes in, in sort of public policy and law have undercut the institutions of marriage and family. So kind of given these changes, both kind of in the culture um, and in law and public policy, that would kind of dovetail with some of the observations that Robbie George made um, in his book, how is this affecting men today? Um, What's the consequence um, for men today? Um, To kind of play on your comments and sort of making them immoral would be kind of one way to think about this. But I want to think about kind of this from sort of the, the civilizational perspective and sort of thinking about kind of the American civilization's concern with, um, as the Declaration put it, life, uh, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but also kind of thinking, too, about um, understandings of the American dream as well. And from the kind of perspective, though, of the Declaration, I think we can think about on the sort of the the point about life in part here from men's perspective is that we've seen uh, record increases 
and, for instance, uh, suicide and death of despair. So just yesterday, the CDC reported to us that um, yet again, last year, we have seen um, a record high in uh, suicide in this country. Um, and we know, of course, that men are most affected by this because men are four times more likely to commit suicide than are uh, women. And here, um, the retreat for marriage has been unfolding um, that Mark touched on over the last uh, really uh, five decades um, has had a, a disparate effect on men because men who are unmarried are the ones who are most likely um, to get uh, to, sorry to commit suicide. So this is sort of one area where the sort of the life piece is affected by the retreat from marriage. When it comes to liberty, uh, we can think about um, obviously over the last couple of decades um, the tremendous amount of incarceration that we've seen play out in the United States it would be sort of one example of uh, men not being able to exercise uh, their liberty. And um, what we know from uh, Raj Chetty's data is that one of the top predictors of men being incarcerated is um, the share of single-parent families uh, in a community. So here we can kind of can see how declines in marriage have helped to sort of negatively impact um, men's liberty. And then when it comes to kind of that classic American pursuit, that is the pursuit of happiness, um, we have uh, a new paper from the University of Chicago telling us that since around 2000, happiness has come down. Uh, for both women and men, um, and my own work indicates that really the sort of the top predictor of happiness for men in America is a good marriage. And given the kinds of dynamics that Mark has just been talking about, obviously fewer and fewer men have access to both a good marriage and just marriage more generally. So this is sort of one more way in which kind of the retreat from marriage has um, ended up affecting men's access again to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And then finally, on the American dream point, um, we know as well from Raj Chetty's work and some work of other economists that um, you know, one of the top predictors of kind of realizing the dream for poor kids, including poor boys, is the share of two-parent families in communities across the U.S. And so the fact that there are so many communities now that have um, you know, many, uh, many single-parent families is kind of limiting the ability of um, of poor boys, you know, to rise, to experience that rags to riches story that um, has been central to the American experience and to the American dream. Um, so these are just some of the ways in which I think this retreat from marriage that's unfolded over the last uh, five decades. Uh, we've seen the, the marriage rate fall by 65% since 1970, for instance, has affected men's capacity to um, enjoy their lives, to enjoy their liberty, to pursue happiness and to realize the American dream. So, um, and this is all, I think, all kind of playing out empirically in ways that Robbie, um, Robbie's book would, I, I think, um, lead us to expect. And so unless and until we can kind of uh, turn the corner when it comes to the culture and our public policies and our laws in ways that are more marriage friendly, we aren't likely to see a revival of marriage um, and men's fortunes as well. So concretely, what we could do, I think, would be on the cultural front, and maybe Ian will speak more about this, is to think about how um, we could promulgate the success sequence in both public schools and PSA campaigns. The sequence, of course, being the idea that we're telling young adults that if you get at least a high school degree, you work full time and get married before having kids, your odds of making it. Um, financially and otherwise, are, are quite high. Only 3% of folks who do the sequence are poor when they're in their late 20s and 30s. But using the sequence as kind of a, a vehicle for kind of communicating, especially, I think, the value of marriage to younger adults to make them more enthusiastic about making the, the sacrifices that marriage requires uh, and pursuing it more directly. Um, I think it means uh, looking much more seriously at what's been called um, kind of limbic capitalism. You know, if you look at the top 10 you know, corporations in terms of their market capitalization in the United States from, um, you know, uh, Meta to Microsoft, and they're, they're more in that top 10 group, a lot of them are making a lot of money um, by getting our young men hooked on um, things that are not good for them, things that were referenced in part by Mark. And so we need to think about, I think, new ways to um, regulate <clears throat> them um, you know, we have sin taxes for you know, alcohol and tobacco. I think we need to think about sin taxes for, you know, uh, uh, for Meta and, um, and Microsoft uh, when it comes to things like 
uh, gaming and um, and the new AI companions that are going to be coming on board in, in a big way soon. Um, and then finally, I think in terms of thinking about public policy, looking at addressing marriage penalties in programs like uh, Medicaid, and when it comes to family law, looking at ways to um, uh, reform marriage law. We're not going to go back to the sort of fault-based model for marriage that existed prior to the 1970s, but I think we can think about ways to sort of uh, reform marriage law to make um, divorce more just and uh, even uh, less common than it is now. It's been falling since 1980, so that's a bit of good news there. So these are some of the kinds of things that I think would make um, both marriage stronger and more attractive and appealing and would help steer our young men, our boys, our teenagers, um, our 20-something guys away from some of the vices that have been um, fueled by a variety of developments, both in the culture and in the economy in recent years. So we need to think about you know, all these different measures as, as ways to make men more moral and to strengthen our core institution, which, of course, is marriage. So that's my comment. Thanks. So I don't think these statistics uh, shock you, and I think that's probably the reason why you do what you do, Ian. Mm-hmm. Um, I am undaunted in front of these statistics. Um, uh, thank you, and hopefully this is a bit more of a hopeful um, uh, presentation. It's a great honor to be here on the 30th anniversary of, of Making Men Moral. As I thought about this, I, I, uh, I kept uh, coming back to a quote. It's always been influential for me. It's uh, Frederick Douglass when he said, quote, it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men, end quote. Um, That quote from Douglas has always provided me inspiration for why I'm both a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and why I also lead uh, public charter schools in the Bronx in New York City. It's far more effective to shape the moral attitudes, skills, and behaviors of a rising generation than to take on the tall task of having a lost generation of grown-ups unlearn what they think they know, and find a new path. Uh, You know, my own personal story, on July 11, 2016, at about 4 p.m., I had an epiphany moment that made me realize even more the importance of what Douglas said of building intergenerational advantage versus trying to repair generational disadvantage. As some of you know, on that hot summer afternoon on 149th Street and 3rd Avenue, in the South Bronx, I discovered the Who's Your Daddy truck, uh, a 22-foot baby blue uh, Winnebago truck that turned out to be a mobile DNA testing center on wheels in which low-income folks were spending somewhere between $350 and $500 to take swab tests to answer questions like, are you my sister? Could you be my father? deep questions about identity. Um, That experience, along with learning that the non-marital birth rate in this community in the Bronx was 84%, led us to begin teaching the success sequence in schools. It's actually how I first um, discovered, Brad, that this data was out there. You know, especially for boys who are not always seeing positive role models in their lives, we determined that one step in helping boys make the transition to manhood is to teach them that for young people who do complete just a high school degree, then get a full-time job, so they learn the dignity and discipline of work, and then if they have children, marriage first, 97% of millennials who follow that series of decisions avoid poverty. This is an important step to helping young people realize that the most profound decision a human being can make is to bring another human being into the world. And I encourage middle and high schools across the country to incorporate teaching the success sequence into their curriculum. And through AEI, we will soon be offering a curriculum free of charge to any school in the country on how to do that. But here's the thing. Teaching the mechanics of the success sequence is not enough. Uh, It's necessary, but not sufficient. 
sharing data alone uh, lacks a moral dimension. We have to ask ourselves, why would a young man or a young woman, for that matter, choose to engage in this disciplined, future-oriented behavior, especially if they are not surrounded by healthy, married families that could provide an inspiration to let them know what is possible and that the wait is worth it. Without some underlying ethical conviction, it would be very difficult to muster the courage to withstand the social pressure. We must be intentional about the type of morality that we want our young charges to pursue if we want them to truly lead self-determined lives of meaning and purpose. That's why I've become so focused on cultivating agency in young people. And I define agency as the force of your free will guided by moral discernment. The force of your free will guided by moral discernment. So think of agency like a vector, like velocity, where velocity is not just speed, it's speed and direction. So if agency is free will plus this moral discernment, where does moral guidance, where does that moral guidance come from? And for me, one way to provide guidance is to build schools that are open about their deliberate desire to indoctrinate their students into a core set of values. I've now, la- I've now launched Vertex Partnership Academy as a public charter high school in District 12 in the Bronx which seeks to develop virtuous high school graduates who've acquired the habits, knowledge, and sense of personal agency necessary to lead self-determined, purposeful lives of American and global citizenship. The school is organized around the four cardinal virtues of courage, justice, temperance, and wisdom. And they're called the cardinal virtues from the Latin root cardo, which means hinge, because they are the root virtues upon which all other standards of moral excellence depend. Each virtue is an intrinsic life habit that we seek to cultivate cultivate within each student. And the idea is that when normed and practiced regularly, these individual behaviors then form the collective basis of a good society, a community that is self-governed, by public virtue. And for each virtue, there is an I statement. And we require our students to memorize these I statements as part of the process for how we want them to internalize their sense of personal responsibility and agency. So for courage, the statement is I reject victimhood and boldly persevere even in times of uncertainty and struggle. For justice, I uphold our common humanity and honor the inherent dignity of each individual. Temperance, I lead my life with self-discipline because I am responsible for my learning and my behavior. And finally, wisdom, I make sound judgments based on knowledge of objective universal truth. The idea is that our students first learn these virtue definitions in their head and ultimately in their hearts to manage their own attitudes and behavior. If we want to build a self-governing free society of morally minded citizens, then we need to create environments in which the norm encourages impeccable character and behavior and that there are social sanctions for deviating from that norm. And let me just make one point, since this is focused on making men moral. You know, one point I must say is that prior to running this virtues-based high school, for 10 years I ran a network of all girls and all boys, elementary and middle schools. And while there were certain pedagogical practices that differed in these single-sex schools, the core underlying values between the schools did not differ. We required both boys and girls to live up to the core value of responsibility, which we defined as doing the right thing even when no one is watching. 
I say this because in the quest to make men moral, it is not only necessary to cultivate boys to be respectful, to honor individual dignity, to do the right thing even when no one is watching, we must also cultivate strong girls with equal moral fortitude, girls who expect principled behavior of themselves and demand the same from boys. There has to be reciprocity. And while I started my remarks with a quote from Frederick Douglass, here's another quote, give me a child until he is seven and I will show you the man, end quote. Some say this quote is a Jesuit motto, others attribute it to Aristotle. Either way, it underscores the idea that it is important to start early with the end in mind. And ultimately, when it comes to the idea of making men moral, I think we all want a world in which no girl or boy ever has to ask the question, who's your daddy? Because the answer will always be, he is right here. Thank you. So, Mark, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, Based on everything you've told us, if you had to go another 30 years, because we're looking back, Robbie, 30 years, now let's look forward 30 years. Is there any sense in which you find optimism in the data or does it look pretty pessimistic to you? 30 years is a long time in this domain, which is ironic given that <laughs> marriage and, and uh, sexual relationships are very old. Um, but the, the thing is so dynamic yeah. that uh, I'm not sure I could, could speculate too widely on sort of like the situation with, with marriage. I mean, we can't continue this a point, a percentage point a year decline for the last forty plus years in the in uh, uh, the marriage rate in some ways. Um, when will that hit bottom? I think there's there's something something to say for that. Now you you, you see in uh, some other countries how. Um, the average age at marriage or the median age at marriage keeps increasing. But there's a ceiling to that. It seems to be around 32, 33 for women, maybe 34 for for men. You, you can map it in Scandinavia easier because they've kind of, they didn't really give up on marriage, but organized cohabitation took its place uh, a while ago. Um, but people still marry, uh, um, but organized cohabitation means something different there than it does here. So, and their median age at marriage seems to have peaked. It's pretty stable. And it, the, it's bottomed out that there's sort of the, uh, the share of people who marry by, say, age 30, right around 20 to 25%. So there is some levels below, it seems, which we're probably not going to go. Um, because people still connect childbearing with marriage tightly. I mean, it's one of the the amazing things that continues to happen is, well, why do people decide to marry when they're, say, 33 or 34 or 35? Because they kind of still want a shot at marital childbearing, right? Because women, on average, do not wish to have children out of wedlock. They don't want that. When they have that situation... It's it's seldom because they're you know they're giving it a, the 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 union a thumbs up, um, so I think there are there are reasons for think seeing we're, it's going to bottom out, but does it mean it's you turn a corner and you start to increase the marriage rate? I don't see the signs of it. Uh, you know, see the kind of the way we go about meeting today, online is taking over fairly rapidly. And um, they're, they've, they've tweaked it fairly significantly in the last decade or so. Now you have this bumble kind of like, let's give some power to women, which is an admission that the whole thing is kind of male-dominated, right? That men get their, what they want much easier than women do. So let's try to turn the rules a little bit. Uh, what else can they do towards that end? Um, 
I don't know. I, I, I don't believe they're, they're so-called data about what's a right around the corner. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's a wishful thinking. They want this to occur. And so sometimes if you plant ideas in men, you, you, might, you, you have the hope that it will catch on. But I, I think broadly speaking, sociologically, individual men may act differently. But what should you expect is uh, you know, men respond to, to demands made upon them. If they don't get what they want easily, they'll work harder for it. That's just not the situation. I don't see that changing soon. So, Brad, um, you've written a lot about the transformative power of marriage. And um, so I'd like for you to talk a little bit about the many different ways in which that is evidenced in the data. And then also hearing Ian uh, with a bit of good news, I think, um, are, are there, and uh, you alluded to this, interventions that we can be thinking about um, that would help communicate this transformative power of marriage that you might share with us? Yeah, so I think when it comes to um, understanding kind of how marriage affects men, I mean, one domain obviously is just sort of um, when it comes to work. And we see um, is that men tend to work harder, they tend to work more strategically. Um, they work, um, you know, more hours, so that's not going to be unemployed. So um, a colleague of mine, for instance, has found that when it comes to sort of the job search process, basically, that um, men who are married are much more likely not to quit their current job until they've identified the next job, right? Whereas men who are single are much more likely just to quit that first job and then kind of to look around for that second job. So they're less prudential than men who are not married. Um, she also found, too, that in, in her sample that men who were married were much less likely to be fired um, than men who were single. Mm-hmm. So it's these kinds of dynamics you know, in the workplace and in men's lives that then translate to what's called the, the marriage premium, and that is that men who are married earn between 10 and 20% more than their peers who are, who are not married. Of course, the question there is how much of that's really a causal effect of marriage mm-hmm. versus just the kind of idea that some men are, are more you know, have the kinds of traits and endowments and orientations that make them both more marriageable and, and more responsible and successful at work. Um, and we do actually have uh, now twin studies. Um, and we find, for instance, in one twin study from Minnesota that um, identical twins, um, the guys who were married were earning about 26 more percent than their identical twins who were not married. So pretty robust evidence that there's something causal about marriage as an institution that motivates men to take their work more seriously, um, working on behalf of not just their wife, but also their children. We see actually the premium is highest for men who are in intact married families with children. So that seems to tell us that, you know, that the sort of um, power of marriage when it comes to work is, is pretty powerful and profound. And it's related to the sense that they are, they are kind of working for not just, again, their spouse, but for uh, their kids as well. Um, what's also interesting, too, about this... Um, this work on kind of how marriage affects men's lives is um, that it's not just sociological. I think people can kind of intuit that story to some extent, like I've just explained it, but it's also biological. And this is new. I mean, I think we all recognize that when women have, for instance, um, you know, when they're pregnant, their bodies change in profound ways. Their hormones change in profound ways. But we're learning more and more every year about the ways in which family life affects men biologically as well. And so there's been work done, for instance, in the Philippines, um, tracking men longitudinally and showing us that when they enter into a co-residential sexual union, their hormones shift, their, their testosterone levels, for instance, come down. And then when they have a biological child with um, that partner, um, their testosterone levels come down even more. Um, and so there's a way in which, I mean, you've heard the term that, you know, marriage and family domesticate men. Well, that's, that's actually true physiologically, okay? So men are less likely to, you know, than in the wake of all this to be as aggressive and as likely to be, you know, um, going from one, you know, oriented towards going from one part to the next. So, and of course, marriage has been an institution that has, you know, has helped to put cultural norms and, you know, values and practices 
kind of around that process in ways to sort of facilitate it. So um, those are just kind of two examples of the way in which men are transformed by marriage. And it's important to note that um, there are no group of men today in America who are happier in that 1855 bracket, in that prime bracket, than men who are married with kids. Um, we just did analysis of the General Social Survey. You know the GSS well. Um, and married men with kids you know, are in the top bracket there for happiness. Um, and also, there's actually an AI report today from Dan Cox, who's a survey researcher at AI, telling us that many women today think that men benefit from marriage and kids, but that women do not. So just as a side note, I wanted to just, you know, basically tell everyone here, especially the women in the audience, that the story is the same for women in the GSS. There is no group of women who are happier in the United States today um, in that prime band from 1855 than women who are married with kids. Yes, being a mother, you know, I can be extremely challenging. I recognize that. Um, but the particular women who are kind of in that, in that middle age band of 35 to 55, the women who are married with kids are just doing markedly better <clears throat> than their female peers who are not married and who are not moms. So um, for both women and, and for men, you know, this core institution is, um, you know, is, is valuable from a, a psychological perspective as well, not just a financial perspective. So that's sort of the positive story about marriage. And I think, also, I'm not answering your question, but I do want to stress we're in a conservative think tank and one of the stories coming out in my book in February, which is called Get Married um, with HarperCollins, is that um, ideologically speaking, there are no group of Americans who are as happy with their lives um, as conservatives are. And I, I think probably one of the biggest reasons that's the case is that conservatives are doing relatively better in all of this. You know, so they're more likely to be getting married in the first place um, they're more likely both the women and the men to be happily married in the second place. And those two facts, social facts of being more married and more happily married are a, a big part of the story that explains why we see in public opinion data um, that conservatives are the happiest Americans. So they're the ones most likely to kind of be realizing that, you know, that classic American pursuit, that is the pursuit of happiness. So that's sort of, again, a, another kind of piece of good news for this audience here. Um, but in terms of, I think, what do we do? We've talked about the sort of success sequence. We've talked about, um, I think, trying to reform you know, some of our means tested programs and policies to stop penalizing marriage. We've talked about the need to reform marriage law as well. Um, I think beyond that, um, we need to also think creatively about you know, public messaging campaigns, especially on social media, to kind of reach the rising generation, because we know that if the kids don't kind of turn around on this issue and to have a sort of a deeper aspiration to get married and to develop the virtues that will make them good spouses, then we're going to be in trouble on this score. And then I also touched, too, on technology, too. I think we've got to think about new ways to contain not just these devices um, and not just the gaming Xboxes that Microsoft produces, like I referred to earlier, but we are now seeing the development of these new AI platforms AI companions that are extremely com sort of compelling and intoxicating and I, you know, are going to be drawing in our, our kids and our young adults and many adults in, in ways that I think are going to be profoundly dehumanizing. Um, and so that's going to affect, obviously, men and, and women and boys and girls. Um, so thinking about, you know, how do we, how do we tackle these technological um, developments in ways that allow us to, um, you know, um, you know, resist the sort of temptation just to sort of interact with um, devices rather than with real people. So if we, can't, if we can't sort of figure out, and we're not going to put the technology back, obviously, into the bottle. That's obviously not happening. But are there ways that we can kind of um, use pu both public policy and civil society um, and our family you know, uh, practices to um, limit the power of these devices and then also to push the technology in a better direction. So one thing, I just to sort of on the Bumble piece, I, um, one of my friends from college um, at UVA, his son has actually just started a, a new app that's using, a dating app that's using AI as well. And it seems to be pretty, you know, pretty good. Um, but the aim of this app is to, is to help people get married. So you only go on the app if you're looking to get married, right? So this is the way in which we could kind of begin to use technology 
you know, in a more constructive way rather than Tinder is obviously it's about hooking up yeah. in, in large part. So there may be ways we can kind of use the technology that's developing to steer us in a more humane direction, both for women and especially also for, for men. Great. Thank you. So, Ian, <clears throat> I'm hoping that you're going to tell us that all across the country there are examples that are similar to the one that you've talked about in the Bronx. I hope you're not going to say <laughs> that you're an outlier. <laughs> Well, I'm weird, but um, <laughs> well, I guess let me just say a, 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 a couple of things. So one is, um, I do think it's important to distinguish that marriage is definitely in the, the, the decline, but there are dramatic um, educational differences in marriage, right? So if you look at college graduates, there has not been this decline. We're very slight, uh, where the, the the age of first marriage, even though it's getting older, is still several years younger than the age of first birth. Thus why the non-marital birth rate for college graduates is still maybe 10, 11%, which is relatively low. And if you look at uh, high school dropouts on the other end of the spectrum, you see that what you call the great crossover, the age of first birth is younger than the age of first marriage. And that occurred 50 years ago. And the non-marital birth rate there is 83%. And so you've got this big swath in the middle now, sort of high school, some college, that's 60% of the country. The crossover occurred maybe 20 years ago where, again, um, first births are now happening before first marriage. And the thing that in running schools, though, my, my students, like they, of course, they don't know these numbers, but their aspiration is to lead a great life. And and even though they're not seeing it in their community, they feel it's the right thing to do. It's, it's, a, it's, a moral, it's a moral thing. And so when we talk about the success sequence, it's very interesting. What they want to know, okay, well, how? How do I do that? How can we, rem- we remove the obstacles so that young people who are pre, um, predisposed to do these things? Because I hear that all the time. Well, these people are married. They're predisposed to get okay, well, I've got young people. I want to make them into the kinds of people that are predisposed to do these things. And so, so for example, um, in the district where we just opened up our high school, in District 12 in the Bronx, of the 2,000 or so kids that start traditional high schools in this district, um, four years later, only 7% graduate from high school ready for college, right? Meaning that they start ninth grade and either drop out or four years later, they do get their high school degree, but still can't do math nor reading without remediation. And yet, in New York City, there's a cap on charter schools. So if you had a great idea to open a great school, you couldn't do it. So the first rung of getting on the success sequence, something seemingly as simple as getting your high school degree, is not so simple, right? So so the solutions to things like marriage or or making men moral, we have to remove the obstacles which involve things that are actually outside of the realm of some. So school choice, educational freedom becomes a big first step to remove the obstacle that makes it so hard for kids to get on this path. Okay, the second step, you know, full-time work. Okay, well, we're going to have apprenticeship opportunities within our high school. So at the end of sophomore year, students will be able to choose either a diploma pathway or a careers pathway, they all have the opportunity to apprentice or internship at New York City Hospital or a Google so that they have the opportunity to earn an industry credential with labor market value at the end of four years of high school. So that's a way that more young people can get the experience of actually working and what that responsibility means. So I'm much more optimistic about these things. I think we're tapping into an intrinsic desire to do the right thing and um, you know, I'm, I'm championing the success sequence everywhere I speak, but I've come to realize it, it is. It's not enough. We have to create a virtues-based context for our kids. We have to recognize the obstacles that stand in the way of what they want to do anyway. And um, so that's why I just remain determined to get these things done. Do you think that America's houses of worship are resource-rich in terms of helping with this? Well, oh, do I think our houses of research, houses our houses of worship, of worship are resource rich? Well, absolutely, but they're not resource distributed. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, 
um, you know, Raj Chetty does his, his Land of Opportunity um, study from 2014. You know, you look at the map of the country of, you know, what's the, the, what's the likelihood of a kid who was born in the bottom 20% income level 30 years later being the top 20%, and he's got this incredible map. Salt Lake City is first in the nation. Um, but you look at the map and you see very wide um, uh, distribution of, of which localities and the three, dri- three of the primary drivers for what determined the likelihood of upward mobility. One, the percent of strong families um, with um, uh, single parents, that's number one. Two, the number of individuals engaged in religious practice and the other in- involved in uh, local civil, civic organizations. And third, the quality of the K-12 system. Mm-hmm. Just so happens, the, the three rungs of my free, <laughs> my free um, framework. But strong families, strong religious organizations, yeah. and educational freedom and school choice. Like, we know these things. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's why I feel those are... These are the things that we as grown-ups control. Like, we we're talking about social media, of course. Okay, so I run a school... Last year when we opened, we trusted our students to, um, you know, carry their cell phones and not use them. And guess what? That didn't work, right? (laughs) So this year we said, okay, when you come to school, we've got something called the Yonder Pouch, right? The Yonder Pouch is a very cool little device. So every student has to deposit their cell phone, their smartwatch, their AirPod, everything into this pouch. And it's locked for the entire day. And it's amazing. There's like a little bit of, you know, yeah, 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 in the first couple of weeks. But now our kids love being in an environment mm. where they don't have to deal with the drama mm. of these devices. And so for a moment, for like eight or nine hours, they're in an oasis yeah. where they're not texting, they're not going on TikTok. Even, you know, even though they were supposed to be in school, these were things that were still happening. All this just comes like, like we are the grown-ups. Like, we can decide these things. Yeah. And so far, I just sometimes, it, it stuns me that we whine about these things, we complain about them, but we're in a position to do something, especially as it relates to the rising generation. Yeah, great. Well, we're going to open it up to questions uh, from the crowd. <clears throat> Some microphones come by, I think. Yes. We have one in the front. George, raise your hand so they can see you. Byron, thank God for you navigating this panel uh, and the depth. All three of these guys are uh, just as deep as you can get. Um, it was about 15 years and one month ago that a former AEI that everyone in this room knows wrote a column. It was former Speaker Newt Gingrich. And the title of his column was Let's End Adolescence. And so my query is, with so much governmental bureaucracy focusing on early childhood development, is it time to reorder perhaps even a hearing, not in the Ways and Means Committee, but if men are necessary in society, should we have this hearing on restoring men and masculinity in the House Natural Resources Committee? And should we begin to evaluate pushing early adulthood as opposed to early childhood? Should we be looking at brain science and how quickly these kids in the digital age are moving faster than anyone else in this room? Is is that the beginning of the path to get to where all three of you are talking about, which is really a generation that is resisting committing. They want to be involved in stuff. But marriage requires commitment. And people do not want to commit too much more when they have a plentitude of choices. Can any of you kind of share some thoughts on uh, on this collage that uh, I may have thrown out? Brad? So I think one thing I would just say in response to that suggestion is that there, we did a survey um, at the Institute for Family Studies on um, the public's interest in forming commissions on boys and men in five southeastern states, and about three quarters of the respondents were, you know, were for that. And as we've talked to the state legislators on this topic, there's a, a you know, real interest. So I think there is an open, openness now to kind of addressing in a more forthright way the sort of 
And obviously Richard Reeves over Brookings did a book on the subject as well recently, too. So I think there is at least a growing recognition um, in the public at large and in public policy um, makers that we have a real problem on our hands with boys and men. And so I think that becomes an opportunity for us to begin to think concretely about where the concrete measures we can take. And obviously I love Ian's example about their approach to technology as, you know, as one that we're seeing that kind of approach is sort of spreading across many schools nowadays, um, both public and private. And that's sort of one way, I think, to help, you know, both our young men and our young women to um, have um, not just better educations, but more virtuous lives as well, too. So, but, but I think some kind of commission that was, was kind of charged with addressing the crisis and articulating some responses could, you know, could be helpful at the state or federal level. Most of the dialogue seems to be about toxic masculinity lately. <laughs> Which, you know, I understand that, but uh, how do you get to a discussion of sort of masculinity in general? Uh, Toxic masculinity seems to be driven by essentially sort of a radical feminist culture, but then even a discussion about what is masculinity and what what is the meaning of marriage in men's lives, that seems to just, I, I can just see a big battle over like, what does this mean for women? Right, because the academic cadre of of uh, again, I'm not talking about a regular feminist. I'm talking about a radical feminist. They have they have no interest in a, a discussion of masculinity as as an idea. Um, so what you call for is is a good idea, tough slogging to get there. I mean, just one thing. I mean, uh, like generally, folks who are really um, supportive of early childhood development, typically more progressive, um, want to make large investments there. I actually think there's an opportunity. If you do look at brain science, what's happening zero to three, what are the environments um, where healthy brain development occurs, right? It, it occurs in environments that are stable. You're, you're absent of ACEs, you know, adverse childhood experiences, and what kind of environment is that? Well, typically, it's a child being raised in a married to parent household. So maybe there could be a way to merge this sort of pre-existing support on the left of early childhood development with brain research and the value of stable households for children. And it could become an area of, I don't know, uh, dual consensus to to just reiterate this importance of family structure. And we've none of us have talked about Melissa Kearney's book um, thus far, the two parent. Privilege, which I think is a very, very important book that hopefully is forcing um, people who are typically warring on this issue to let's, we can at least now acknowledge the importance of family structure and, the, and particularly two parent households as the best structure for children. And now we can have a more bi- bipartisan discussion about the how to get there. I think we have a question here. So a question initially for Brad Wilcox, but for anyone on the panel who has an opinion on this, and it pertains to the data you mentioned about how conservatives are the happiest cohort in our population. Uh, I don't need data to know that. I would just go the default premise that, of course, they are because, to put it in one sentence, they're most in tune with the moral order of the universe, to use Russell Kirk's shorthand phrase. Okay, a lot to unpack there. But I have presented this data to pe- for liberals and people on the left, and the responses I get range from ridiculous to cartoonish. They'll say, well, that's because conservatives are richer. And you're richer people, are, you know, okay. Sure. Uh, or, uh, right, uh, by the way, I'm, I'll bet that's not true if you break out the data. I've never had time to go to do the cross tabs. Uh, but, uh, or they'll say, well, it's because they live in a bubble and they don't pay attention to what's going on in the world, as though we don't read the New York Times and what, okay, and what things that make them sad. Uh, or even more cartoonish as well, it's because conservatives are part of the oppressor class. And, so the question is, what explanations or responses have you heard? Do you hear any that are more intelligent than that? Do you hear others that are worse than that? And what, what, do you hear any thoughtful responses from liberals when you present this, that, which ought to be something that's a challenge to the liberal outlook on the universe? Yeah, so there has been obviously a, a fair bit of commentary on this particular question, and it is true that that one of the sort of progressive responses is that conservatives are just sort of happier with injustice, 
and 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 right, no, and, and with and the world as it is, and so you know, and then the world of course is deeply you know unjust and unfair and everything else, and so conservatives can just kind of have made their peace with that, and they can kind of live their lives you know blissfully ignorant of all of the you know inequity that surrounds them. Um, but empirically, though, we know um, both from some work that I've done, from work that Pew has done, work that other people have done, that. A, a large share of this difference is sociological. And so it's partly about, you know, just I was saying about the marriage piece and the family piece. Um, conservatives also report more satisfying family lives as well. Um, but also about religion, obviously, is part of the story as well. And Byron's work, you know, would dovetail with that. Um, and on some measures of community engagement, although it depends on the measure, conservatives are more likely to outperform, you know, um, progressives. Um, and then moderates, on, some, on the family stuff, actually, it's the moderates who are often doing the worst. So um, the people who don't have strong, kind of clear visions of the good life, right? They're, and they're sort of just, you know, middle, middle of the road types of folks and folks often are maybe less um, connected to a variety of community institutions as well. So, but I'm saying that there is a lot of work on sort of the, the, the power of institutions and community and how conservatives are often more integrated into those institutions. But the other piece, too, that, that has been signaled by Pew is just the way in which conservatives are more likely to sort of value work in some ways. That obviously dovetails with Arthur Brooks's, um, you know, uh, research here at AI and kind of to also value kind of an ethic of personal responsibility, which dovetails with Ian's work on, in the book Agency. So um, you can kind of, what I'm saying is you kind of can break out how conservatives are doing better than liberals in a very kind of empirical way and understand how marriage, family, religion, work, and personal responsibility account for a lot of this gap, um, but not all of the gap, to respond to the sort of the progressive view that this is just because conservatives have a, uh, a sort of rose-colored view of the world that, that they don't. I would also add, though, too, that newer work that's being done by Jonathan Haidt tells us that and Jean Twenge, who are social psychologists, tells us that, that, that among young adults, particularly younger women, um, liberal women are especially bad off right now psychologically because they have kind of embraced a more, you know, catastrophizing view of the world. Um, and 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 both I think Jean and John are center left people, and they're saying that what's happening out there with regards to to social media in part is just giving, especially younger women of a more progressive, you know, perspective, a very dark view of the world that then affects their broader outlook and, and, and their emotional well-being too. So. Yes, in the back. I wonder if any research has been done on the, the impact of humor and hip culture. For example, uh, Portland, Oregon, as everyone knows, I'm from Oregon, is, is really a center of incredible decadence in many ways, <laughs> drugs and, and so forth. But has it, if you all remember, about 10 years ago, it, there, the bumper sticker was, keep Portland weird, as if it was, you know, there was Portlandia and so forth. And now it's just a hellhole. I wonder if there's anybody that's done studies of that. And also getting to the, the idea of women being the saddest group that with, for example, Portland has a, a square now in, in honor of a formerly of a, a drag queen who was a local character. And what does that say to young children that, uh, for, for example, a boy with, with all of you are talking about that the idea of a man, a man is really a woman and to a little girl that a man is really a, a, a is a woman also. So there are no men. I mean, there are, and, and the fact that the feminist culture the women do not speak up against drag culture because they don't want they don't want to seem blue nosed and prudish and puritanical because there's so much stigma against speaking out. J.K. Rowling's is the only one that has, and she, she's in position to do so. I'm aware of no such research. Really, uh, I, I'm not familiar with research on that kind of subject. Um, one thing that did segue with what we were talking about just a second ago is that uh, transcendence is kind of a, a pretty important phenomenon for for happiness, for seeing, val I mean, perceiving a future, etc. 
something bigger than you. So, uh, so I think one of the things you can link to conservatives and happiness, and you can talk about like wow, how does Portland fall flat on this, is uh, um, an idea that your happiness is up to yourself somehow. And I think progressives are much more likely to latch onto that than conservatives. Um, that some things are taken for granted, givens in the universe, natural law to some extent, but uh, also sort of the, the idea that there are claims made upon me uh, that are not mal- you know, not malleable. I don't. So when you think about linking this to transgender somehow, um, this idea that you know you could change this too, right? Everything is changeable, and I. It just does not comport with human happiness. Um, but no, I am not aware of particular research on uh, the thing that you asked about. Yeah, uh, and really, I'm not familiar with research um, in Portland, but I will say in Oregon, uh, they just made a decision uh, two or three weeks ago that affirms something that's uh, again, I think so harmful to kids. So the uh, the Oregon State Board of Education, in the name of equity, to somehow uh, protect um, minority kids from oppressive forces, have removed the requirement to uh, demonstrate proficiency in reading and math in order to graduate from high school. Now it's they'll be much more subjective. Uh, processes and just last week, New York State uh, announced that it's probably moving in a similar direction to eliminate something called the Regents requirements. These are all things that go actually against the the very things that we need to do to help young people aspire to greater expectations and greater standards. And so, these are the things that we have to um, uh, fight against. It, 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 we, we're having a conversation about how to make men moral, how to make moral make uh, kids' moral. We know these things. We know strong families, high expectations in education, strong faith commitment. We just have to keep coming back to those as the anchors, as as sort of our answer to some of these crazy ideas. Like rather than spending all of our turf, uh, spending time on other people's turf by <laughs> saying what's wrong with these ideas, what are we articulating about the institutions that we know uh, work for children? We have a question here, and then we can go right back here. Up front? Then we'll come back. We'll get two up front. It strikes me as... as... Yes. Yes. Um, The discussion around loneliness and alienation has become Mm -hmm. quite, I don't want to say fashionable, but certainly touched on our own Surgeon General... Uh, Vivek Murthy has called this a crisis of loneliness. I wonder, in the context of family and some of the issues that you're talking about, deaths of despair is also seen under this broader umbrella, whether, and it's a very kind of multipartisan and also nonpartisan area of research. We've got economists, political scientists, psychologists, all involved in the impact of loneliness, alienation, the furthest extent of it is, uh, at least in the eyes of some, is this increasing uh, issue of suicide, which has been t- touched on by this panel. I wonder if some of the work that you're doing could be seen in light of or as a response to this broader theme yeah. around loneliness, where there seems to be a growing broader both academic and policy acceptance that this is a, a real crisis. Uh, I, I think so. I'm always looking for ways to find the nexus point um, with, you know, normally warring, warring factions. I mean, it's somewhat symbolic. You remember uh, Dr. Ruth Westheimer? Remember her? She's like the expert on sex, right? Um, last week, Governor Hochul announced that she's now the ambassador of loneliness in New York State, which is very funny, I think. Um, uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I think that... Um, <laughs> Um, I think very much the things that certainly I'm uh, focused on, like our, the kids in our school now have more time to actually talk to one another in like face-to-face conversations because they're not um, on their devices even in the you know, three, four minutes of transition from 
class to class. So it does feel like that's another opportunity for us to come together and say this is a common issue. But just in general, you know, I'm talking about 40, 50 year declines in marriage, almost linear. And now we're talking about a linear increase in loneliness. I mean, do the math, right? Yeah. I wanted to build on your earlier question about adolescence. Um, Ian, you quoted, you know, give me a boy until seven and I'll give you a man. But doesn't the key moment, a key moment come later to make a man? Um, And you all have said quite a lot about marriage and sex and personal responsibility and commitment. But in appealing to young people, especially young people going through puberty, it seems to me that love has a lot to do with it. And I haven't heard a lot about love from all of you. So I wonder, you know, apart from the data, how does this fit into this early uh, education that young people should be getting? I mean, marriage, being raised um, uh, two-parent, I mean, for me, it's the essence of of love um, and commitment. Um, so a lot of the things that, again, we, and we could do it even more, is talk about relationships, first as humans. Um, that's why our, our virtues center around this idea of inherent, um, respecting the inherent dignity of each individual. Because we're, sometimes it seems we're in a society right now where before we even get to love, we have to cut through sort of the balkanization, like you're black or you're BIPOC or you're transgender, it's kind of the the labeling, the dehumanizing of whole groups of people and then ascribing certain characteristics, oppressed, oppressor, marginalized, non-marginalized. So A, I think first we've got to sift through that and just remember that we're all individual human beings with great capacity, then talk about relationships. Um, and then certainly when it's, when it's appropriate, uh, talking about love in that context, that's what I think you're referring to. And I think that we have to kind of also get this, that there's, we need like a media detox here, right, for, um, you know, for our kids and our teenagers oftentimes, because when I was at, I was in all places, Utah earlier this week, and went out for a Mexican meal with a friend, and we're surrounded by these big screens um, in this Mexican restaurant in Salt Lake City, and people dancing and doing other things that kind of would suggest to us that, like, it's all about lust, you know, that, that's sort of what love is about, it's about lust. Um, and then there are obviously other forces in the culture and the pop culture, especially, and, um, and to some extent on, online, kind of would tell us that kind of love is about kind of the soulmate model, where it's just all about kind of this intense emotional connection between two people. And that's going to kind of sustain you, you know, kind of, you know, for the distance. And we know kind of from an older perspective, obviously, Leon Cass is writing, you know, Leon, of course, being a former fellow here at AI, um, is, has a much sort of richer and deeper and sort of thicker understanding of love. Um, and so trying to kind of communicate to our, our young adults, to our kids, that love is about, you know, much more than lust. And it's about even more than the sort of soulmate model, that there are ways in which, you know, when you get married and become a wife and a husband and a father and a mother, you know, it's a, to an important extent about willing the good of the other to use sort of St. Thomas Aquinas' conception of love. So kind of trying to communicate that sort of richer love that would incorporate a number of goods um, beyond just sex, beyond just sort of that romantic connection, and um, to encompass the multiple goods that are associated with marriage and family life, I think would be would be the ideal when it comes to sort of educating yeah. kids at your stage of, yeah. of life. Yeah, and there's nothing like the message of love when kids see the two adults in their life express affection for each other mm-hmm. consistently. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, a beautiful, that's a beautiful way to um, demonstrate love. Sophie, the gentleman to your left has been waiting patiently. So I'd like to uh, ask a question about um, the interaction between sociological research and sort of philosophy and theology. So the the uh, observation was made that happiness follows being in alignment with the, uh, the, the universal norms of the universe, the moral norms of the universe, which, of course, is the eternal law of God. Um, and Ian made the point that uh, families and children perform better 
who recognize the existence of God and are involved in religious practice. So does the sociological community or anyone within the sociological community say, well, that data is right because it's true, because God does exist, because there are universal moral norms, and because the good life is not something we define for ourselves, but is objectively extant that we must aspire to and meet? I don't think they do that. <laughs> frankly, not in my experience. Maybe Brad, you know. <laughs> but you know, we have met decent sociologists along the way who believed those things, but that's not near the core of the discipline. Uh, right? It is a, it's a far periphery, perhaps. Uh, are there interactions? You know. I don't hear it much, I'll say that. I, uh, I think Brad and I probably are similar in this, is that we see it, sociology as a tool. Uh, it's a method of collecting data and making observations, etc. You know, I think they comport with what you say. At the same time, um, you know, I'm very familiar with how people can torture the data to get to say what they want, right? So that... Uh, it seems much more a battle of narratives in sociology. And part of the problem is like we're massively outgunned, outspent, out all that stuff, so that we're minority voices. But I think we're rational and reasonable minority voices. Here and here. Thank you all for being with us. Um, so there's been increasing political polarization along lines of gender in recent years. And I think statistically and anecdotally, that is uh, the most extreme among younger people and Gen Z. Uh, so I guess, do you all have any thoughts on what implications that is going to have going forward for our politics, but especially for marriage and family formation and, and, and other phenomena. So uh, <clears throat> Lyman Stone and I published a piece on this in The Atlantic a little while ago, just making the point that we are seeing, obviously, young women move in a more progressive direction um, and young men moving in a slightly more or you know, conservative direction or not as, not as progressive as women. And so there's a basically a gap where the progressive women don't have enough, you know, progressive men to kind of date and, and potentially marry, um, and the conservative men don't have enough conservative women to potentially, you know, date and, and, and marry as well. So there, that, this is part of the, you know, one additional problem besides the ones that Mark articulated at the beginning of our session that is confronting young adults today. So I think one reason, too, at least in the short term, to be fairly pessimistic, about both marriage and childbearing in the U.S. Um, so we've got multiple reasons, you know, ideological, technological, um, the class divide you touched on, Ian. There are a lot of factors that are you know, the public policies and legal dynamics that Robbie articulated in his book, you know, a while back. So, yeah, I think it's going to, this is more rough sailing ahead, basically. Um, and I would say, now, the Washington Post did run a piece before things. Giving, I guess, uh, I think before Thanksgiving, yes, highlighting this this challenge, and for the first time, the editorial board was both sort of saying that you know this is lamentable because marriage is associated with good ad- outcomes for adults and for the society at large. So that was actually nice to see the Washington Post editorial board kind of you know hooray for marriage. But and they, they suggested that young adults should be kind of dating and marrying across ideological lines, um, and so I, I, on the one hand, I think that's a that's a a good gesture, but I would also say, too, as a sociologist who studies these dynamics, that couples tend to be more likely to flourish when they're on the same page ideologically, particularly now around issues related to sort of work and family, um, so having kind of common expectations about how they're going to organize their work lives um, and how they're going to handle, you know, the bearing and rearing of children as well as a couple. So what I would say, I guess, to the Post is, I'm all for a Republican and a Democrat getting married, but just be very clear about how you're going to, you know, 
be on sort of roughly the same page when it comes to these sort of big questions revolving around how do we handle you know work and family and are, are, and are, if we're on the same page on on those issues then you know but for a lot of folks it's going to be hard to to navigate yeah. that I mean as the marriage rate goes down you've got quest- people asking questions single people who will take care of me who will watch out for my interests and Women and men veer in very different directions on the answer to that question, and it has a great deal of political valence and repercussions. So, and one more point just on, on that, too. I mean, I think we've, in the, obviously, we've had this idea, you know, on the left for a while that sort of immigration and the increasingly, you know, the demographic shifts unfolding along lines of race and ethnic immigration would kind of push us inexorably in a democratic direction. And now we have scholars here at UVA, I mean, at, sorry, at AI, who are kind of pushing back against that. But on the single piece, I think what's also interesting, judging by these recent trends and also like the South Korean case, what we're seeing is that, yes, single women are moving in a very kind of progressive direction. Um, but for single men, what we've been seeing both in the U.S. a little bit and South Korea in a big way is that single men are moving right. Um, so I think the point I'm getting at is that we can't assume that kind of um, the retreat from marriage and the rise of the singles would inexorably steer us in a, in a straightforwardly progressive direction because I think single men become, as we've seen in some ways too in the U.S., but especially in South Korea, they often tend to gravitate towards um, more populist and anti-feminist, um, you know, leaders. Well, I think we're out of time. I know there were some more questions, but uh, join me in thanking our panel for a great discussion. <laughs>